It's just the three at the bottom here, right? So Python and C Sharp, yeah, both popular and loved. That, I think this is sort of the part of the superpower it makes sense. Of, uh, of C Sharp, uh, and it's something we're going to work hard to, to keep at as we try to, as we broaden the addressable audience, so to speak, to make C Sharp uh, stay a desirable language. Um, I also want to call out that we have, a, we have a number three here as well. It should be familiar to many. F Sharp uh, has a really, really um, dedicated community. And once you, it's, once you pop, you can't stop, right? So, um, so go take a look at F Sharp as well. Um, they also have a category called most dreaded technologies. That's the ones that um, uh, most people use that would like to stop doing it. Right. We, wanted, we felt we had to show this, otherwise we would feel. <laughs> They got the joke. All right. um, it would have been disingenuous not to show this. So. Yeah, it would be dishonest not to show this. But to be honest, uh, when we saw this here, uh, we kind of fell off our chairs. Um, <laughs> personally, I was very happy I was even sitting on one. Um, so we were like, what? Um, it's not that bad. Um, it's, I, I don't believe this. It says it's more dreaded than Pearl. <laughs> yeah, what's possible. up here? So we had to do some thinking, and because it, it's not just that we're in denial. Well, maybe there's some of that. But um, it, we, when we talk to the VB community, this isn't what we get. right? We don't get that people really hate it, and they just want to get out. Um, so uh, I think uh, a part of it, at least, is that this is the Stack Overflow developer survey. The, the, the people who self-identify as VB developers, they're off somewhere else in a forum that existed long before Stack Overflow. Uh, and, <laughs> and this is not a theory. They, they, we know this to be true. Um, and, and actually uh, being a happy community over there. And the people who, who are on Stack Overflow are the ones that love another language, and they go to Stack Overflow to follow that. But they have to use VB despite their, uh, their desires in the daytime. Uh, maybe it's even VB6, because this doesn't call out VB6 versus VB.net. And you know what? If I was forced to do VB6 in the daytime, and I was going on Stack Overflow at night uh, think, dreaming of a better life, you know, I'd probably be on that statistic as well. Um, so uh, we think that's part of it. That's part why it's so bad. But we also. We, we talked a lot to the VB community, um, especially the last year. And we are realizing that this sort of automatic uh, approach of doing everything to VB that we're doing to C Sharp, just sort of automatically, um, that doesn't seem like the right approach. VB developers, C Sharp developers, they want different things, right? right. Um, I think VB developers value stability, quality, uh, support. They value awesome tooling. Uh, C Sharp developers like those things too. but they. They're more inclined to want to have new features, to kind of um, uh, be modern, have the language be modern, to have the language actually you know, kind of stack up to some of the languages on top of that loved list that we saw before. Okay. So uh, you're going to see us starting to differentiate those two languages more and, and do things differently with them uh, as we go. But you know, much as we love F Sharp and uh, Visual Basic, uh, we're going to start talking about C Sharp, because that's a language that's in the title of this talk. Um, right. This is what I call my rainbow slide. You'll find out uh, soon enough uh, what I mean. Just to, just to remind you of all the things that have changed about .NET and about around C Sharp yeah. uh, just over the past couple of years, right? Uh, from being a Windows technology, it now runs everywhere. Um, and we mean more and more seriously everywhere. From um, sort of at the technological level, from being a system component that everybody sort of had to agree on uh, um, being pre-installed on Windows, uh, you can now deploy .NET with the app. Um, as part of that in core, for instance, and, and do side by side, have much more componentized uh, experience. Um, runs on a VM for sure, but more and more so you can choose to run it, uh, to compile it down to native if that fits with your uh, performance profile and your deployment profile if you find compiling down to specific um, architectures. And now to things that are near and dear to Dustin's heart and mine. Um, uh, we used to have black box compilers. Now we have Roslyn, open compiler APIs. Everybody can ask questions about C Sharp, compilers that don't just compile. Um, we have uh, a clicker that doesn't run. It's not uh, written in .NET. We heard that. Yeah, it's not written in C Sharp, session. anyways. We like to come back to themes in all the parts of the trilogy. Um, uh, the Roslyn technology itself actually enables this uh, uh, moving from just being a Visual Studio language to you can, you can write C Sharp in any editor you want. And finally, of course, really a really big point here is that uh, we move from a proprietary technology proprietary technology to being open source. And so um, if there's a part of the story that we are not filling out, somebody else will, right? And they are. Yeah. This is, a, this is a really important. So talking of Roslyn. Yeah, let's talk about Roslyn. So um, you want me to take this, uh, this clicker? All right. 
So uh, I do want to talk about Roslyn. This, is, this, is, this talk is called The Future of C Sharp. Uh, Maz and I have done, it, you know, done this talk a couple of times now uh, here, and we love coming here and talking about this. But, um, but we, don't, we can't really give, give the same tired old talk and have it be the future of C Sharp anymore, right? Because um, Roslyn shipped. We actually did. Um, there was naysayers and, and disbelievers, and, uh, well. but now, now we did ship. And now we're coming up with kind of what's next for that. Uh, where do we want to take Rosalind? We're, we're fairly ambitious people. It's, you know, we are. Um, and so we see Rosalind uh, becoming really the C-sharp and Visual Basic language engine for all the things. You know, that's all the editors and IDEs. That's all the linters and analysis tools, the fixers, the refactorings, the code generators, the scripting, the REPLs, anything that deals with C-sharp code and needs to be smart about it, right? It needs to do some analysis or code generation or you know, any kind of developer tooling. We want to see Roslyn at the heart of that for, for a number of reasons, right? Um, you know, the, one of the biggest is that it, you don't have to, when you go and build your own language en engine to do those sorts of, uh, build those sorts of tools, you end up having to chase the language, release after release, and try and stay caught up, um, you know, and make sure that, and, and of course there's the very hard task of just making it correct in the first place, right? It'd be nice to just, much better if you just use the compiler that we provide an open API on top of. And also, as we all kind of, you know, all the community comes and starts working with Roslyn to put it, you know, right in the center of, of all, at the bottom of all of these tools, um, the, con the contributions that come back to it make it better. It makes it better for everybody. So uh, this is happening today. Um, you know, Xamarin Studio 6 uh, was a big, a big change. They replaced kind of the language engine they had in the IDE for their, uh, for their tooling for things like code completion and formatting. And today that sits on pretty much on Roslyn as is uh, in Xamarin Studio 6. Um, also, we partner pretty heavily uh, with some guys uh, uh, and, and have a project called, uh, called OmniSharp. Has anybody, you guys heard of OmniSharp? Um, it's a cool project um, with some very, very smart guys behind it. Um, we're deeply involved with it because what OmniSharp does is it takes and, and uses Roslyn at the heart of it to kind of process your project and be able to, uh, to, to query this little language server to get back, you know, hey, what would I show in the completion list here when I press dot in this particular file, for example? And it has a little HTTP or, you know, standard in and out. You can kind of communicate with it. And then also part of OmniSharp are a number of plugins, right, for different editors that talk to that server. So I could have, I could use OmniSharp with Vim, I can use it with Atom, I can use it with, uh, gosh, Emacs and Sublime Text, and, and at Microsoft, we use it uh, to power Visual Studio Code um, and, and ourselves and our own, our own idea experience. And that's, that's something where we're partnering with the community, putting Roslyn at the heart of this system and be able to create some amazing things so that you can take and use, do C-sharp development anywhere you want to on any platform. That's really cool. Yeah, it so, is pretty, it's pretty cool. It's, it's interesting that the um, that uh, the fact that C# -sharp runs on Mac and Linux and all these means that means that we can run Roslyn on them, so that we can power IDEs through mm -hmm. OmniSharp on those platforms as well. Right? Right. It all comes together. Right. So so as we as we kind of forge ahead and figure out what we want to do there um, and how we can contribute ourselves the most, and it's, it's more now thinking about okay, we we created this compiler API surface area where you can ask about C-sharp code. Now it's like, well, let's think about the next level, the higher level APIs, thinking about we need an API for completion lists and that sort of thing. Um, but when it comes down to it, what it really is, is we want there to be, and this is, this is a statement that Mad said to me, I totally agree with it. Um, so we want there, there should be only one code base in the world for understanding C-sharp. That's how we feel about it today. So if you're trying to, you know, if, if you want to go build something that targets C-sharp, get involved with Roslyn. And, and go use that and, and help us make it better and better because it will make it better for all of us. Okay, so that's what we're well said, we're my going there. All right, all right. So let's dig in. We've got a few things we want to talk about. Um, first of all, we want to talk about C sharp seven. Lucky number seven. Okay, I'm sure, you're all good. excited about that. You've seen a few things here and there, but um, but that's all. You know, a lot of the other talks are they're just looking at the sausage. Maybe just show you a little bit of the sausage. We're going to get really you know, involved and see how the sausage is made and see, you know, some of the issues with the sausage and perhaps other flavors of sausage and perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm taking this too yeah, far. I, I... Uh, 
Uh, I want to look really briefly at VS Code integration. I talked about how we could take you know, Rosin and, and, and kind of take it everywhere and use it at the heart of other tools. And so I want to look at VS Code. And then we're going to look at um, some of the ways that we've been uh, taking advantage of Rosin to improve what we call the inner loop, kind of the inner developer loop, which is kind of the features that you use every day when you're writing code, editing code, navigating code, trying to understand a code base, kind of those the, the, the features that um, become part of the things that you do, the tasks that you do over and over again. We want to take a look at some of those features. So, cool. You ready to take it away? Yeah, whoops, we are out of slides. So, uh, we better show some code. Okay. Uh, you want to press number six over there? Sure, we are out of slides. I swear, we are totally out of slides. So, um, here's a very interesting C Sharp program. So, C Sharp 7, um, it's what's next after C Sharp 6. Uh, the, the thinking, we sort of, we have a, a lot of new possibilities for how we are going to uh, rev the language going forward. And we said, you know what? So we've been looking at a bunch of very interesting language features, and some of them take a long time to kind of design and develop and, and prototype and get feedback on, and some of them are more quick. We said, we shouldn't, let, we shouldn't have that hold us back from having a higher cadence of releasing the language. So we're going to try releasing C Sharp 7 a little yeah. quicker. We're going to put some features out uh, that are ready, and we're just going to keep some the fact that some of the features that you may be seeing on GitHub is working on, the fact that they're not in there, that may just mean that they're in the next version. Like, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna up our cadence, or at least try it now, uh, up our cadence on, uh, on the language and see what happens. So it's gonna be slightly fewer features, but it's gonna come out quicker. It's gonna come out with the next Visual Studio. Right, so you guys know how some of you have come up to us over the years and said, man, things just coming out too fast. Yeah. We didn't listen. Yeah, we just made it worse. <laughs> it's not happening. Yeah, sorry, you don't have to upgrade. Oh wait, maybe you do. I don't know. Yeah. Let's oh, let's well. make it that way. Okay. So um, let's uh, in, for the next 22 minutes, let's uh, let's play with some language features. Um, and for those of you who were for, here for the first part of the trilogy, you saw some of them kind of scrape the surface. I'm going to try to go a little deeper. Uh, at least if I can start coding instead of talking, um, we can get there. So I'm going to give myself some numbers, and yeah, Scott Hunter had some numbers as well. If you were here, but mine are going to be better because yeah. I'm going to have. You should start um, with two. I'm going to have these numbers Ooh. here. Uh, you know, those those are real computer numbers. Um, but actually, you know, I'm I, I only know the first 20 by heart. So so um, I, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to write them differently. I'm going to oh, I'm going to write them as binary literals. Um, just to start with a small feature here, we now have binary literals in C Sharp. So if you really want to show those bit patterns, you don't have to be part of the secret brotherhood of hex. You can, um, you can just see the bits, right? Okay, so uh, I'm still going strong here. Thank you. But whoa, um, I'm kind of starting to have trouble counting all the zeros here. So let's put some uh, digit separators in there. Um, that's also something you couldn't do before, but uh, you know, as you were numeric literals uh, kind of get big. It's nice to have, some, to have some kind of separators. And you can put these wherever you want. It's not, I just put them at every four because you do that for binary. But if I wanted to have, if I wanted to have about 14 of them right here, I could do that too. It's, That'd be it's great. Really, yeah, that really makes it more readable. So, um, <laughs> okay, those were some small features just to get us warmed up. Okay, ready for the next trick? I am, I am. They were clapping okay. for binary literals. Yeah, so these guys, uh, this these is guys are... They're in the palm of your right, hand. The, the people who were not sure they were coming to the session, they're out there in all the restaurants eating all the food. <laughs> so, um, so let's write a, let's write a, write a function to, uh, to uh, kind of summarize this array of numbers. Um, so um, we want to know what, uh, how, what, what the sum of them all is, and we also want to count them. So uh, we have to return two things. Um, well, I'm returning two. Int, what's going on? You're typing inside a method. Uh, That's crazy. Why would yeah, you do what, what, is, what is this? What's going on? Oh, don't tell me you were at the first talk. You already know. Um, let's make this a static method so we can call it. Whoop. That's not. You're inside that. a method body, man. I am. Whoops. Why is this working? Why is it working inside of a method body? I don't know. I've never seen this. Ah. It's because um, we have something called local functions uh, as well in C Sharp 7, where you can actually write your helper functions inside of other functions. Um, uh, and um, kind of structure your code like JavaScript, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> or yeah. just, you know, you decide, hey, um, you know, you, you, it's not so much that I want to pull my helper functions into my functions. It's more like, oh, this is getting a little complicated. I want a helper function 
oh, now I have to pull it out as a, as a peer function of the one I was already writing, but that means to get all the context that I had out there, I need to pass parameters and all kinds of stuff. If I just write it in here, then I could actually just use uh, the locals that are in scope here, um, like the numbers uh, local that's here. Um, I'm not going to do that because I actually I'm going to call this method uh, recursively later. Um, so, uh, but another thing that happened here, so that's local functions, got that? Another thing here is that I am returning two numbers. So this is a tuple. This is a tuple type. We now have tuples in C sharp. Okay? Yeah. So um, just to uh, do a dummy implementation here to start with, here's a tuple literal. Okay? It's kind of it's kind of obvious. You kind of get the get the general idea here, right? Um, so um, if I go and call my method, let's call uh, tally um, with the numbers array that I have up there. Um, you see that it returns a tuple. This, this is going to look nicer in the final bits. Let's grab it. Um, it would be nice if I could actually just have two variables right here and kind of deconstruct or split the tuple back into its component parts. And we're, we're working on that, but I don't have, I don't have that working yet. We, we haven't decided on a syntax. We were talking yet. about it at breakfast, actually. Yeah, actually, yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas the, you know, the rest of this is old bits from uh, last Thursday. Yeah. So, um, I, I should actually mention, we have, uh, our machines up there here are almost steaming with the Franken yeah. builds we have installed. Some of these bits are in kind of Dev 15, hidden under flags. Some yeah. of them are, you know, in, in Visual Studio 15, rather. Some of them are, uh, you know, built from other places and pulled in. We are, we are going by the seat of our pants, and we might crash and burn, and you might feel slightly satisfied by that. That's yeah, that's going to be fun. <laughs> Uh, so actually, that's mostly him. Yeah. Um, so everything I'm showing you in the language, except for tuples, is in the in the build that you uh, that you probably have already downloaded and and spent way too much um, of your mobile allotment on. Um, so <laughs> anyway, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna grab uh, the tuple as it is into T here, and let's print something out. Um, let's do one of these. This newfangled feature uh, that has been here since last summer. Um, that uh, was we presented, ship. was yeah. presented, that we shipped, that was yeah, presented as a new feature earlier today. Um, and let's just say sum by is sum is the uh, is t dot what actually. So by default, uh, tuple has an item one and an item two. Okay, that kind of works. Uh, oh, I'd probably want the other one. Um, and the count is probably the other one. And t dot item two. Okay, what? but it's not. It it works, but it's, it's not, not very great. pleasing. Yeah. So what you can do is instead you can go and, uh, and this is probably the most important part. You can go and give names to your tuple elements. Um, so I can say there's a sum and the count. That, that doesn't change what the tuple is at runtime. Actually, these names are fake compiler names, if you will. Uh, so the tu a tuple is a tuple, and it's just based on the types and the and the sequence. Um, but you can give these names, and what that means is that you know not only when I hover, it tells me nicely that one you know one is the sum and the other is the count. But more importantly. If I, uh, if I go to the completion list here, even though you can see item one and item two still working, they're not squiggled, uh, they're hidden now, and I get nicer names that I am strongly encouraged to use instead. Right? So I can say t.sum and t.count, and the compiler just count, compiles it down to the same thing. But <laughs> So just the documentation of that and the way the code looks nicer, I think that's an important addition to the tools that many languages have. OK, so um, now you might notice that um, I'm, soon I'm going to actually implement this method, so don't worry. But um, you might notice that this kind of looks very similar to, uh, to a parameter list, right? And this is a symmetry that's actually intended. We really, um, we really exploit the a, a symmetry or an analogy between uh, tuples and tuple types and parameter lists, right? It's, so they both have sequences, uh, positional sequences with types for each element, and they both have names that are kind of uh, useful, but not, um, but not. Uh, Sort of essential to the consumption experience. Okay, so it's kind of it's kind of a similar thing, and similarly for um, for uh, tuple literals, we kind of think of them in an, an analogous way to um, to argument types. So they're the arguments that go into the tuple type, and so you can actually also have named arguments. So I could I could use or named tuple elements. So I can use the same syntax um, as as I use for named arguments to also create a um, a tuple that has names here. You notice it has different names than the other one, and the compiler's happy. Like, you can change the names all you want. They're just this compiler helper thing. We're not going to stop you from doing it. So now I'm going to actually implement the method. I'm going to uh, introduce a, a, a local variable. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do it manually because demo bits. Um, 
So, oh, wow, what happened there? Var, let's call it. Not that far. R equals, wow. This is, um, this is what you get when you work in demo bits. So I'm actually uh, introducing, um, I'm, I'm having a, a temporary variable here that's uh, the tuple, and I'm going to reach over my list and, um, and compute the, the sum and the count here. So um, let's for each um, bar b in the list and um, do something. And the something we do is so um, let's take wow let's take nobody's the, ever used that type s byte s byte <laughs> why is it even there yeah what were we thinking okay so. I can access r.s here because I gave it a nice name. But one thing to notice is that I'm actually, so I'm going to update the tuple as I go along as an accumulator, but I'm actually updating it field-wise. So, so it's actually a mutable field here on, in the tuple. r.s plus equals the b, and let's also increment the, uh, the count there, plus plus. Those, those members are just fields. They're public fields, and they're mutable. Why isn't that terribly bad? You know, concurrency, shared state, why, why isn't the world uh, Going down here, well, because tuples are structs, they're value types, and so you're not actually sharing them, right? It's just a, it's just a local with two, with two parts to it, and so this is totally fine. It's useful. It's also more efficient than if they were, were read-only. So people who tell you that tuples should be read-only, well, they, they're not supposed to, they shouldn't in C-sharp. So we're not using the tuple type that's in the framework? We're not using the tuple type that's in a framework, which is a reference type, and therefore it's very important that it's immutable. Otherwise, you easily end up sharing state uh, through the tuple that things can go wrong, um, we are introducing a new underlying tuple type. It's kind of very similar, except that it's a struct and it's, and it's uh, mutable. I actually have it, the source code for it here. I'm not going to show it to you. I have time. So um, that's tuples. You like them? Yeah. Good. Actually, a few, a few more things to note about them. They're, this is a real type expression, right? So if I, if I wanted my method to be async, uh, you know, async, come on. Async um, methods, it's re even harder for them to return multiple results today because they, don't, they can't have out parameters. Um, so, but you can have a task of a tuple type, and you can just do it like this. Um, now you have an async method, uh, returns a task of tuple, and <laughs> I waited there, <laughs> the tuple comes back out. That right? looks like TypeScript. With, it, with the names and everything, right? Because the compiler tracks it through. Now, it doesn't want me to await because I'm in and non async method. That's why he doesn't I, want you to type async there. You should file that bug. Yeah, I it should doesn't file like it. You type it yeah, can you do that from body. stage, please? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but let's not, let's not um, keep it async here. Um, so, another thing I, I just quickly want to mention um, is that uh, because tuple, tuples have value equality and, and a value based hash code, so, they, so when you compare them equals, they just compare their elements equals. And that means they're great for uh, keys in dictionaries, for instance, whenever you want a dictionary that has multiple keys, like I want a key both by H and name or something like that, you just put a tuple type in there as a key, and everything works out. Like when, then when you look up by name and age, uh, give it another tuple with those two in, those compare equal and have the same hash code, and everything just works out. So now you have a super simple way of having, having multiple keys for, for dictionaries. It's just great for many, many things. Um, just little transport types, uh, kind of transient. Okay. Enough about tuples, you think? I, I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, that was a lot about tuples. That was a lot. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, another thing I want to talk about, pattern matching. That's actually on your machines there. Um, it's a feature that's in flight. Some of, the, some of it is there. Some of it is not there yet. I'm going to show you the, the part that's there. So let's take the um, surprise. So, <laughs> so let's take the, uh, the numbers and generalize them a little bit here. I'm actually going gonna, gonna to comment out these. Oh, the, the, uh, It'll come one out here bad. That's I'm, bad. Yeah, I'm going to need it later. But I'm actually going to extend the ex example a little bit here for, to an object array because I want to now work with recursive lists. And I want to do it in a really dirty way. So I'm just using object arrays um, and kind of saying that uh, a recursive list here of numbers is just one that wow. uh, its elements are either ints or they're object arrays. So <laughs> by a, convention. You're, you're a horrible person. Isn't that bad? Wow. That's like a Cards Against Humanity play. It's yeah, terrible. right? I'm going to make you look at it for quite some time, too. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, of course, um, now that I make it, made it an object array, I can't call tally anymore because it takes an int array, but I can change that. But when I do, um, I, can't, um, wow. I can't add v anymore here because it's not known to be an int. So we've got to check if it's an int and then only do this if it is. Um, so, uh, it really is like JavaScript. The, the, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> it, 
Oh, come on. <laughs> You're just taking all the types maybe I, away. <laughs> maybe I spent too long in TypeScript after all. OK, so uh, let's take the V and check if it's int. OK, that's what you do today. And then, OK, I checked. Now I forget all about it. And then I have to go and cast V again to int, because otherwise I still can't do anything with it. Uh, except that now you can put an I here. You can declare a new variable as you go. I'm checking it's, I, it's, it's an int. I'm giving it the name I as an int. And then I can just add that int here. Uh, Scott showed that as well. Um, the, the interesting part here is that this is, just not, this is not just like a nifty extension of the is operator. This, the thing that we have here is a new kind of thing in C Sharp called a pattern. OK, so some languages, functional languages, have pattern matching. Uh, and this is sort of a, a foray into that. So a pattern is something that you, know, you can take, a, you can take an, a value, and it can both test the value to see if it fits the pattern or not, if it matches it. And it can also, as it does so, if it matches, it can extract information from it into fresh variables that you can then use in scope of where you know the pattern to match. OK, that's pretty powerful. Um, a pretty powerful uh, control structure, really. Um, so we, we took patterns and we integrated them with the is expression. Um, and uh, it, we, all, and uh, we have more, so more complicated patterns that I can show you in a bit. But we also have more places where you can, uh, where you can use patterns. Um, so the other one that works in this prototype is that um, you know, if I was going to imagine I was going to go on here and say else if, and then do the same thing, v is i enumerable of object, blah, blah, blah. You'll notice that all the if conditions are about doing, asking some question of v. So this is more like, a, except uh, it isn't here. Um, but uh, that's because I put the else if in the wrong place. But it doesn't matter, because I'm going to delete it anyway. And I can imagine in, how you lost your space in, and your spot in, and all of that. Do it in a different way. So, uh, so the, um, uh, the thing that would be nicer to do is, to, since we're examining v all the time, why don't we just switch on it? So if we turn this into, instead, um, a, um, a switch, let's say switch on V, and now I realize my code was wrong all the time because I forgot to have curlies around the logic yeah, there. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for not. Um, thanks for nothing, bro. You're um, welcome. So I, uh, let's go and put some curlies in there for the switch. Now in, in my case, so I can, first of all, I can switch on anything now, um, not just the primitive types. I can switch an object or whatever I like, and my case statements can be, thank you. They can be much more interesting than just constants. For instance, I can take that pattern from before if, wow, what is wrong here? It's all my fault. I haven't implemented any of these features in Intel yeah, since okay, yet. Yeah, OK. And I can use patterns for my cases. I can say, uh, if v is an int, call that i. And in this, uh, in this um, uh, part, of in, under this case block here, uh, I, I can use i. Let's see if I can format this better. I can use i uh, in there, but if, uh, on the other hand, it's an i enumerable of object, then I can use this case instead. I can call it l colon, and we could do things the other way, uh, which is to, um, what, what do we actually want to do here? This is where we want to call the, um, the tally recursively. So it's, uh, say, tally of l here. Um, and then we can update in a different way. We say r.s should be uh, incremented with the sum that was in there. And uh, r.count should be updated with the count that was in the, in the recursive count of the list, right? So that, is that, does that sound right to you? Um, are they clap because they think it's a new feature. They're, they're okay. not sure they understand all the code you're writing. It's very right. obfuscated. It is, do you think it's obfus obfuscated? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. I think it's very pretty, actually. I think it's pretty. This is a type switch, right? We have a type yeah. switch in the language now. But it's not, a new, it's not a new kind of switch. It's just the old switch that's been generalized. So if I want to, for instance, I want to handle nulls uh, gracefully, I can still have a case null, which is just a constant. And we can say, well, for nulls, we're just going to skip them. We're not going to count them. We're not going to add them. Um, because now it's an object array. It can have nulls in there. I can actually, let's say I don't want to do all the tallying if that list is empty anyway. So I could do, uh, I only want to do this when uh, l dot, uh, tl, what's it called, l dot any. OK, so I can call the any method on it. Uh, so I can, I can now have conditions as well in my, in my case uh, clauses here. That's cool. That's really cool. Now, of course, I still need to, now I, I just, I'm just passing through all the uh, serial length lists that, of, of course, there's going to be a lot of. So I have to remember to have another case here for i enumerable of object, which I can. Uh, but in this case here, um, we, 
because cases are no longer disjoint, like they were in the old days, they were just constants, they're all different, um, now we actually need to define an evaluation order for switches. So we go top to bottom, just like we do with, uh, with catch clauses, right? So we, we go top to bottom, and that means that if we get here, we know that it was empty, because otherwise we would have caught it up here. Mm. And so I can just fall through to the case that null has there, like you can fall through always, um, and, uh, and so on. I should probably also put a default in there, saying, you know, throw if uh, the whole thing was, was not well structured, but I'm not gonna for time. Uh, so that's, uh, that's some various ways that you can use pattern. That, that's, those are places, existing places in the C-sharp language where patterns show up. And that's kind of how we try to do it. We take this concept from another language, but we try to massage it in so it feels natural with the structures you have, control structures you have, rather than inventing new ones. Right? That's trying to make it keep the C-sharp feel while being, uh, being more versatile. You can, I said you could also have more fancy patterns. I'm gonna show, yeah. I, I pre-wrote some code here just to and not spend too much time on it. I have a little class hierarchy, students and professors derived from person. I have some people here, some students. Uh, David Stevens is very new, he doesn't Ooh. have any grades yet. Um, yeah, you just gave, me, uh, just gave me good grades, it's good. It's way better than my grades really were. Yeah, I actually went and looked them up. Yeah. Um, no, you no this is you. Oh, actually, oh, I flipped them, oh, sorry. Ooh, yeah, okay, yes. so, um, so what you can see is, uh, again, I'm using the is operator here, the is expression here to do a pattern match, but I'm doing a little more this time. I'm checking if it's a, I'm going over them, I'm checking if it's a professor. Okay, so far so good, but instead of just giving that professor a name, I am, I am going into the properties. I'm using what I call a property pattern. So I go in and say, okay, take the subject and apply this pattern to it. Um, well, that pattern just captures whatever the subject is. So that's really just grab it into a variable, but don't put any conditions on it. Take the first name, and uh, apply this pattern to it, and that's a constant pattern like you know from switches already. Uh, that's just, that's, that's doing pure checking. It's not capturing anything, but it's checking that the name is Scott. And so the whole pattern only applies if there's a professor named Scott. And if it does, then I can grab this subject and, and uh, print it out. And that's a lot of people called Scott. So I think uh, it, that's still a pretty broad um, condition here. Um, so, so this is an example, and you notice the last name is not even mentioned. I can just talk about the properties that I want to here. Mm -hmm. um, here's another example with a student. It's kind of similar. I'm grabbing their first name without further conditions. I'm grabbing the GPA, but instead of saying bar G, I'm saying decimal of G, because GPA is actually in there as a, as a nullable decimal, because David doesn't have any grades yet, and we don't want to divide by zero. Um, and so uh, I'm actually filtering on only the ones that have a GPA, the non-null GPA, because they have grades. And so that would only print out Dustin and me. Yeah. Okay? Now I'm done with pattern matching. Um, and uh, I'm almost done with uh, everything I want to show. Uh, so there's one more feature that I can show briefly, uh, which is uh, probably more a bit of a low-level feature. It sort of completes uh, the, the, uh, the ref parameters by ref that you already know all the way back to uh, C sharp uh, 1.0. Um, so let's, this is where I wanna go back to using numbers that are, let's actually delete a bunch of stuff here. How far do we wanna go? All the way down. There we go. Um, I, wanna, I wanna use the, the old numbers. I like the old numbers better. Um, so let's uh, uncomment that and, um, and, whoop, and not delete them. And let's now write a helper method. I'm not gonna make it a, uh, local method, though I could, uh, that we call find, that uh, the idea is that I want to find, uh, find an element in the array that um, fulfills a certain predicate, okay? Um, but I don't want to just get the value back. I want to get the element itself. I want to point into it so that I can mutate it. Maybe, that, maybe the predicate is one that tells me which ones I should change. And so the only way I can do that is to return an int that's the index that, is, that points into the array. So that's, that's quickly implemented. It, it's beautiful code. I, I know you'll like it. I'm taking an int array here list, and I'm taking a func from int to bool, and um, uh, let's call that the predicate. And so uh, this is how I'm gonna implement it. Let's have an i here. Uh, that's the index. Um, let's do a for loop where we start out by being zero, and then we'll say as long as the predicate isn't true uh, on the list of i, keep going um, like this. Isn't that the most beautiful code you've seen, Dustin? <laughs> you, you liked the one before? And I'm just gonna return I here. So, what I, so if I go over the edge, it's gonna go over the edge, it's gonna throw an exception, who cares? Okay, I implemented it. <laughs> um, 
It's demo. Um, so uh, the problem, problem is, if I call this method, define method, well, I get this index back, and then every time I want to do something with a cell, I kind of have to look it up. I kind of have to index again with it. I say numbers of i, numbers of i, numbers of i. Um, and so if, you know, if I was passing things by ref, I could just pa actually pass an array memory cell, and I could manipulate it nicely just as a variable. I could just assign into it and read from it and so on. And so the thing that is kind of missing is to, to kind of flip it around and um, allow you to return refs instead of just uh, allowing you to, uh, to pass them. So I have, can have a ref return. And this is a bit of a low low fee. Again, many of you will never use this, but I, I'm going to show it anyway. It's kind of nifty. So I, so I can return a pointer into, uh, essentially a pointer into somewhere where there's an int variable. Okay, I'm saying ref int. So now I have to return a ref. I'm returning a ref to the, um, it's not actually letting me return a, a ref to this local here because that would, it, it, it's smart enough to figure out that that's off the stack by the time it gets back. So it's disallowing that. But I can return a ref to the list of i here. And that, uh, that's like passing list of i by ref to a, param so to a don't method. Capitalize it. Just the other way around. What's no, that? Don't capitalize it. You'll be better. Oh. I'm blaming, I'm blaming the IDE. If you press tab and let IntelliSense work for you, it does. Yeah. It does. No, I'm blaming the IDE. It's, totally it's a new feature. I know. It's hard to use. So now I get, um, so now I get this thing back. I can say int. Um, and, and I can say int r equals, but now it's actually going to dereference the thing that comes back and just give me the int that was in that place. Instead, I can say ref here uh, to keep the reference that was passed back to me, and then I can hold that in a ref local. Um, so now I have something that you don't have. A, you have a net pass yeah, predicate. Uh, I, I, I debug your code for you, Matt. That's thank what you. I do. That's that's why I bring you here. I know. Yeah, that's clear. So um, so let's let's grab the one that is uh, the first one that's greater than four. Cool. Um, and now it, now it should work, right? So uh, what I now have is a pointer into the array at the place at the first place where something is greater than four. So it actually. I have that variable. I have that uh, storage location in R. Now, so, the interesting thing, Maz, is that normally, you would, if you wanted to do this sort of thing, you just said you had a pointer to something. It's the sort of thing yeah. you would do with, with unsafe code, yeah. right? Um, and here, this is not unsafe. Right. So if you take what's inside of R, dereference it implicitly here, then that should be equal to the thing that's inside of the, uh, what, the fourth element there, probably, if I, if I count it correctly. And so we could print that out and check that those two are indeed equal. Numbers. Numbers. Man. And a following curly. Yes. Anything else? No, that was good. OK. <laughs> now I'm going to update. I'm going to mutate that thing. So, and, then, and then we're going to take and uh, write it out again. So if we look here quickly, the idea is they both point to the same place in the array. Mutating one should also mutate the other, just to prove to you that it's the same storage location. And so while it does that, uh, that's all that I have to show that's actually implemented. Um, uh, that, that totally didn't work at all. Uh, <laughs> so it's probably a. There's, there's clearly an off by one here. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, it's probably number three instead there. But anyway, Sorry. Uh, close enough. I can't do it all for you, man. I can't do it all. OK. Uh, can, you, uh, can you flip me back to slides? I can flip you back to slides. OK. There are, I'm, I actually lied before. There's, there's one more slide. Um, you saw these things. Uh, you have the clicker. Um, I do. There, we're also talking about a few more things. We'll see if they make it in this time. Otherwise, they'll make it in next time. So we're talking about something like uh, records that are really an abbreviation of, very, of classes to represent data. So if you want to have immutable data with value equality and uh, you know, all the defaults of c -sharp are against you, but maybe you could have sy some syntax like this here that, um, that really uh, extends to th all this code. It writes all this code for you in order to have just uh, class-based things that are immutable and value-based. Okay, so write little value classes very simply, uh, just to carry data around. Um, we're thinking about allowing you to use object initializers on, um, on uh, immutable types as well, making it easy to use immutable types in general. Uh, there's a little issue about, it's, it's easy to come up with syntax for this, but how does it actually get the values in? Now we're still struggling with that. We also, importantly, when you're working with immutable data, you often, the way you do it is often that you, there's sort of records of a given point in time, and you still want to mutate, you still want to create a chain, you still want to change them, create a later state of the world, but you do it by creating a new one that looks like the old one, except for things changed. And we're thinking about a language feature to support that first class, where uh, you could take the value that's in P1, and you can get one that's just like it, except with a few things changed, that you give in kind of an object initializer syntax. But other than that, um, I think we're pretty much done with C Sharp 7. So yeah. hopefully there's something in there you can use. Yeah. Over Actually, to you. I'm going to start on this side. 
that side? No, we'll start over here. All right. Um, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit. About, I want to show, I'm going to show some Visual Studio Code uh, integration and what we've been working on there. This isn't uh, amazing, but it just shows that it really actually works. Um, because you know, we've, had, we've had a C-sharp extension in Visual Studio Code for a long time now. Um, and it targeted you know, uh, MS Build uh, projects and also um, the DNX projects of Yor before they made it into .NET Core and all of that. And that's all still baking. So, um, so right now, we're kind of we're chasing after that and making sure that the extension that we have there um, is pretty good. And we, we actually, you know, Visual Studio Code used to ship with a C-sharp experience inside of it already. Uh, it no longer does after it released uh, its extensibility model and its, its, uh, its gallery for extensions last, uh, last, last November's Connect. Um, since then, we've taken the C-sharp extension out of there and we put it on the gallery. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, we did this you know, about four weeks ago, three weeks ago. I'm happy to say that it, it rapidly became the number one most popular extension for Visual Studio Code is to do C-sharp, okay? Um, which, which thrills me because number two uh, was kind of sort of a rival of mine. So um, you're, you're kind of bragging about bullying all the little ones here? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's, anyways, that's I, I've got here, I've, I've actually, I've, I've done .NET new. I've got uh, the .NET uh, core, uh, .NET CLI version. Um, uh, the beta, you know, 1598, that's the one that's released uh, publicly right now. It's not one of the kind of bleeding edge uh, versions of that. And I'd already created in here um, a .NET Core project, okay? And so I, it's just a, a simple hello world kind of app. I'm going to bring up uh, Visual Studio Code, open it up in there. Um, and what you're going to see um, in very, very small font, my apologies for that, um, but you will see down here, you'll see things light up. And that's because of the OmniSharp server that hosts Roslyn and also that we've been updating and working with those guys to update to support .NET Core. Okay, so it provides, up here you see things like code lens appearing and find all references working. Um, if I type in here, you'll get, uh, you'll get IntelliSense um, and all of that. And so this is all coming uh, through Roslyn. This is the extension itself is written in TypeScript, but it communicates with OmniSharp over, uh, over standard I.O. But we also, in this extension that we released, released something kind of extra special, um, mostly for those that, uh, that kind of wanted to go kind of take the extra step and, and dig in. Um, we, we introduced uh, debugging for core CLR, .NET Core-based core CLR apps. And so I can actually F5 this app. Um, it compiles uh, with the .NET CLI, comes in, and it should hit a breakpoint. Yes, it hit a breakpoint. And when I step, you see the values, uh, the locals update over here, and you see our names and that sort of thing. So just more of a sh showing that this stuff is actually coming. It's actually working. Uh, some of these things we're trying to get out. Um, you know, we're trying to get .NET CLI and .NET Core to a, to a, to a good state here shortly you know, in, the, in the coming weeks, and we'll have this extension out targeting .NET Core um, right along with that So, um, in the next, next couple of weeks. So let's move over to Visual Studio 15. Um, 15 in quotes preview, not Visual Studio 2015. Sorry for the confusion. No, it's completely different. Again. Uh, we do this every time. Uh, we, have to, we have to not ship every year. We should, like, wait three years to yeah. ship. Um, or we should start shipping every three months. I'm not sure what you guys want more. Um, now, I want to show a few things in here. I, as I said, I have the Franken build to end all Franken builds in here of all sorts of features I grabbed from various places. And then it was like the team's like, well, it doesn't actually build with Visual Studio 15 yet, so you need to go cherry pick some commits from this up here. I was, it was a mess. It was my day yesterday I spent on that. So, um, but I've got, I've got some things working, and a few of these things are here. You may have seen some of them, and some of them, I'm, I guarantee I have a demo you have not seen at build. Um, and I have bits that have not, uh, have not been shown here. So the first thing I want to talk about, though, is something that we built last week. Like, seriously, like last week we built this. We decided, you know what? Let's go ahead and do it. It'll look cool. People will like it. We can put it in Amanda's demo. That went well. Um, and the idea, it did. It went very well. And so the idea that we now, as you're typing in IntelliSense, we, we will highlight the, the, the span that matched, where the, that actually matched the characters. Because sometimes it's just crazy what it matches, right? You're like, how did that get in there? Um, and it's good to kind of see, so you, can, so you can kind of teach yourself what's actually happening, right? So if I type, you know, and I'm doing like camel case matches, you'll see the bolding show up on the correct characters. I hope that's, I hope that's visible up there. Um, and I'll make it a little bit bigger. That's cool. Yeah, there we go. It's a little better. The IntelliSense didn't really grow that well. But another piece that's on there, and that's kind of cool, um, that we added as part of this as well, and, and seriously, like we did it last week. The editor team checked in an API, we took the bits, we, we made it work. Um, and that's the, these filter icons down here. 
right? Very often I'm working with some, some object, some, some type, and you know, I'm like, especially in this case, I'm like, oh, Mads, why did you have to do link? What yeah. isn't an extension method on All this those extension anymore, methods. right? And so if I just want to see the properties and the methods, I can do that pretty easily and get back to what the instance stuff is, right? And I can filter down, yeah. And for my next trick, uh, I want to show a few things. Um, and that's, that's, that's like magic bits. I hope we get that into you know, our next release of Visual Studio 15. That's the plan right now. Um, so post preview when we do the next one. Um, now I want to show a couple of things that, have been, that are kind of in features we've been doing because we've been trying to fill out this inner loop experience. We want to make this super pleasure for you, for you guys, right? You should be coding in C Sharp and like saliva should be coming out of your mouths. And, and dripping all over the keyboard because it's fun and it's exciting okay. and it just, okay. it's just like, I got it, okay, stopping. <laughs> Stepping back from the metaphor again, okay. Um, and so one of the things I want to show is we've done a lot of improvements to add using. You know, add using when you type a type name and you hope you typed it right, and then if you typed it right, you press control dot and it'll add the using when you press enter, and if you didn't type it right, it'll generate a new type for you because we can't read your mind and you should type better. That one? <laughs> Um, we've made it so that you don't have to type as well. Eh, sort of. I mean, you still need to look. Um, so often, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to type it. I'm doing that exact same thing. I'm typing the type, and I just completely blew it, right? I spelled it wrong. Um, and so with uh, update uh, two of Visual Studio 2015, so this is actually in you know, bits that aren't totally, uh, um, totally fresh, um, we'll go ahead and run a spell check alg algorithm on that, and then go against all the types we've indexed everywhere, and offer you usings where, for things we think they are, and then we'll correct the identifier in the code for you if you choose that one. So if I look right here, you can see that, okay, yes, I actually meant to type XML document, and it'll grab it from using system, or if I picked using system XML link, it would, it would insert X document for me, right? So helping us spell check on these things. Now, and this is, this is, this is pretty cool. Yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> but we, You've probably seen that one, okay? I, I get that you might have seen I, that I, one. I could have used that before. You could have used yeah. that. There's also a feature in Visual Studio called copy paste, so you don't have to type it all. Oh, okay. Um, it's new, this release. So it's actually only in preview bits, okay. so. Talk to um, you later. I'll, talk, I'll show Let's you later. Let's take this offline. Okay. Um, another feature with add using, and uh, again, it's something that we haven't really talked about all that much, but there's a lot of cool stuff in here. It's gotten getting way better. Let's say I want to new up a person. I've got, I've got a person type. It's in a project, but I failed to reference that project. I have a project over here on the, on the right called Super Helpful Helper Library. Um, and it is not, in fact, referenced by the console app that I'm in. So, and I've also typed the person type wrong. But if I press Control dot, um, it goes ahead and it says three things it's going to do. First, it's going to add a project reference for that project to my current project. It'll fix the identifier to match person, and it will add the using for me. <laughs> right? And so then I can go on my merry way and, and, and new up my good friend, my colleague. See, oh, thank you. He'll see if I can spell his name right again. All right. I do. I spell your name correctly. Yeah, it's, it's yes. beautiful. Yeah. All right. Um, now, another piece here, and we've seen this one before. You guys have seen this one here before, but I got kinda, it's kind of like the crowning moment on, on um, add using. And it's something that um, is actually not on by default in Visual Studio 15. So you'll go and grab the preview and try it out and go, hey, this doesn't work. Um, it's actually hidden under a reg key right now because it wasn't quite ready for prime time, but it's, quite, it's totally ready for demo prime time. Um, but that's the one to add a NuGet package, right? So suppose I wanted to use a type like immutable array. Well, I type that in, I question dot. I don't actually have the package, but if I press control dot, it will say, hey, yes, I can add the using for you, and I can add the package. And this project doesn't have a packages.config, so it'll add the packages.config, it'll make the reference happen, and it will undo properly. So, you know, when you're in, like, if you're in a console app like this, or if you're in a WinForms app, or something that targets .NET Framework, and you're not really using NuGet yet, it's like a major thing to go down, right? Because now you've got the packages config, and it, makes, it can make a mess of things if you realize, ah, that's not what I wanted to do. So we made sure that undo works, and it pulls out the packages and config if you're like, whoa, hey, that's not what I wanted. And so uh, that, that whole experience is there as well. All right. The, the question was shouted out, what's the flag? And I will not give you crazy flags to, to edit into your registry from stage. Um, but we'll, we'll try and get that out to you. So if, if people that really want to try it out and play with it and, you know, and give us feedback, 
Um, we'll make sure that's out there for you. And if, I, and if it doesn't get out there, it's dustin.campbell at microsoft.com, and you can yell at me on email. Uh, you can even send it, you can send it all caps and everything. All right. So let's, let's switch over to a different project. I want to talk about a couple of other things that have already shipped. Uh, but we, you know, again, when we ship features like this and we improve the inner loop in updates, they don't get as much fanfare as, as maybe if we shipped in a major version. So I want to share a story with you about, uh, about this code base a little bit. You know, when I, when I come to a big code base, I want to find out things about it. And so I start th looking at interface and saying, who, in who implement these interfaces? And, and in Visual Studio, implementing, like finding out who implemented something uh, in a C-sharp code base is a major pain in the neck, right? Um, so, because you, you come to it and it's like, well, find all references, I guess. That'll eventually show me who implements it, I suppose. Um, and so I come in and, uh, whoops, wrong key, come in. And, uh, and I, I say, well, let's do final references. And that shows me 32 references to this thing. And somewhere in there are the actual classes that implement this interface, right? Um, and so in this, uh, in this release, we decided to uh, go ahead and, and, or in, and update one. We decided to go ahead and add a feature we've been meaning to add for years, which was go to implementation. Right? So this works great if you're on an interface, if you're on an interface method and you want to find out who implements it, if you're on a, an abstract method and you're inside a method body and you want to know where's the override, who's got it, and you want to navigate there really quickly. In this case, we added it in, in, in update one, but we didn't add a keyboard shortcut for it because we're just mean. Um, <laughs> and so you had to like come in and right click and make it happen. But we did add a keyboard shortcut um, in update two, and it is, in fact, control F12. Okay, so control F12 um, in a C-sharp project or a VB project will, in fact, find you the implementers of an interface or an override, that sort of thing. <laughs> all right. I'm coming over to a file, and if you look at the, uh, the, the scroll bar, there's all sorts of warnings in this file. Um, and that's because as part of this uh, Visual Studio 15, um, as, with the preview, we've introduced um, a whole you know, kind of system around code style. Um, and we're really gonna try and go after this thing that is common in every single IDE except for Visual Studio, right? The ability to, to say, my team has a particular coding style and it's more than just where my braces go. It's also about how I name my methods. You know, it's about how I, you know, wanna use the language, whether I wanna qualify things, all those sorts of things. Um, and for us, as we're building out this whole refactoring and fix, you know, code fix story, it's really important because we want you to be able to specify the style that we generate things in. We don't want you to, you know, hit control dot and generate a method and have to go change it immediately to fix up all the stuff that we did by default that you couldn't control, right? Um, but we also want to, you know, stay true to the analyzer story and make sure that these things are enforceable. So when you do, you can specify the things I want uh, the style to, to, to look like, but also enforce that for me. I want this to, you know, and when I don't do this, uh, uh, you know, make it a warning, that sort of thing. And so there's a new options dialog. Uh, uh, there's, a, well, there's a new options page that shows code style. Um, and, uh, and you've seen some of this in other talks, uh, but we've basically, we took some of the code style options that we put into Visual Studio 2015 and we made them more granular and put more options into them, more uh, uh, ways that you could specify, you know, you know, for this dot, I want to qualify, because I like to qualify, for example, fields and properties with this dot, but not necessarily other things, right? Just the things that look like data, for example, is a style I have. Um, now, I want to, in, in, in the sake of time, I want to move on to, though, to naming styles and naming rules, because this is a place where we want to spend a bunch of time, we're going to spend a bunch of effort. Um, right now, um, you know, I've got a rule here. This is super configurable, where I can decide, I want to have rules that target various different types of symbols, um, like I can say I want a rule that, that handles classes and structs and you know, ensures that their names look like this you know, when you know, the, the tick count on my machine is even or something. You can do things like, potentially we would like to be able to do that sort of, that's that level of, of enforcement. But um, I'm not gonna dig too deeply into this, but it is in the preview. So try it out. We wanna take it much further um, where today this is globally scoped. This configuration for these styles is global. We want to make that more granular. We want to be able to have an asset that you carry along with the project or with, you know, be able to specify configurations for a folder of files. So, so I, I could say that my behavior-driven tests, I always like to be all lowercase with underscores for the test methods, that sort of thing. So um, that's a place we want to go. And, uh, and when we go there, not just in Visual Studio, I'd like to take that also into VS Code and wherever you want to write C-sharp code so long as those assets are with the project, whatever that looks like, whether it's editor config or something else, we want to support that. So um, one last demo. 
because we're almost out of time. And it's an awesome demo. Um, and I just, uh, just set expectations, didn't I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, OK. So we get a request an awful lot. And it goes something like this. It says, you know, it'd be really great if you would do something about notify property chain. Um, you know, we really hate this. And you guys are really smart, and the compiler's smart. You did Roslyn, right? Can't you do this notify property change thing? Um, and, and when it comes down to it, you know, it's an awfully specific pattern to bake into the compiler knowledge of. Um, you know, and so we, that's what we tell you when you ask that. Um, and you walk away mad. Uh, you don't buy us the beverages we were hoping you'd buy us. Yeah, uh, I've said it many times. Because you know, they, they say, no, but really, can't I you know, just type this right here and put an attribute and make that work, right? Um, and you know, if you press control dot, the answer is no, but there's a lot of other packages, NuGet packages, that do implement that, and you could use them. Um, we're not going to implement use the, one of those, but there, in fact, this is such a, prevent, like a problem that there are many, many frameworks for doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and generate this type. And then I'm going to do something a little magical. Okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to search on NuGet for a package. Now, you've seen before, and you, you probably saw it in Scott Hunter do this today with FX Cop analyzer rules, being able to go to NuGet and pull down a package and have it bring down smarts that add in diagnostic analysis and, uh, and code fixes right into the IDE. Well, I want to do something like that. Um, what's this called? Build shenanigans. Let's see if it's, might not actually have been indexed. That's okay. I can use my magic code. We'll just go grab it. Super helpful library. Super helpful helper library. Okay. So I'm going to bring up the package count, uh, console. You have a minute. I know. I, I totally got this. Okay. It's fine. All right. PowerShell ever starts up, it'll be fine. Oh, oh Ooh. dear. If PowerShell. I totally jinxed it. Oh, there it goes. Oh, thank oh, God. There it is. Okay. Woo. Let's paste this. And now, of course, the internet will work. Yeah. So this will be fine. Yeah, go. Oh, good. It was fine. Yeah. All right. So now what I want to happen, like, it would be great. Wouldn't it be great if, you know, adding that attribute over there, if I could come over here and, uh, and come to the next line and then type p dot and get, like, property change to show up in there and just see it kind of magically happen. It didn't happen, right? Uh, the reason it didn't happen is because I didn't build yet. So what I've done is I've pulled in magical things that came through NuGet, right? So this is the sort of thing a library could, could couple with it, just like analysis. Um, and now property changed is, in fact, there. And we have done source code generation on the side. So um, I'm just going to set this, and we'll F5. And you can see what's happened here. I'm going to take a f just probably two minutes over to, to describe what's going on. That you guys can handle it. I know it's now. late, and I know you guys are like blood sugar low, um, having not eaten dinner yet. All right. So, uh, oops. Oh, I actually have to change a property. Duh. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm not going to leave it as Dustin Torgerson. Oh. It is our spring fling here yeah, but at the, the conferences. But, uh, All right. Okay. okay. So, F5, it builds. And what's happening here is that. Just like an analyzer, there's analysis going. And an analyzer, diagnostic analyzer, can contribute diagnostics, either warnings or squiggles, based on that analysis. Um, but what we're doing is we're doing analysis that instead of generating diagnostics, generates more code, right? And so we have a partial part here with person that implements I notify property change. And then there's a hidden brand new language feature. And I mean hidden and new, new in the sense that we wrote it last week, um, which is called replace an original. At least that's the name of the keywords. We don't really have a name for the feature. Yeah. I've been calling it sideways overwriting. Because what this is, is in a partial type, I can say this declaration here replaces the one that it looks exactly like. So the compiler will compile to that one. And then I can reference the original declaration with original. Okay? So I can get back at that original property and get its value out and set its value with original keyword up there. Um, and that's kind of how we can make this work. So you can have this kind of sideways sort of, sort of override. Um, so, on the side that makes this happen. So what you did is you download, downloaded a generator yeah. that generated source code that wraps around the source code that the user wrote, exactly. the, the logic to do the uh, uh, notify property change. That That's pretty nifty. Cool. Thank you. So, we're totally out of time. Yeah, we're totally out of time. So we're going to have to say 
Thank you very much for coming at this late hour, for staying an extra minute. Thank you so Looking much. Looking forward to seeing you next year.